some take some part in church or the Sabbath school. They tell me how many people are going to be there. I hope nobody shows up. And uh, they feel comfortable when there are one or two people here at, in the church. But for me, it's just the opposite. If I have a stadium full of 50,000 people screaming, I'm just all pumped up. But when I see empty spaces, I get a little nervous. And I didn't even preach in a church once. And the, the, the special music had just started. And after the special music, I was just, I was to preach. I was mixed. And I looked out at the audience, the congregation, and there were six people. There were six people. I, I had to make myself feel at ease and break the ice. I told them the story. I told them the story of Don Shula. How many of you know Don Shula? Don Shula was the, the head coach of the Miami Dolphins football team for 30 some years. One of the best known football coaches in the history of the National Football League. And every Sunday during the football season, his picture would be there on the television. And he was one of the most recognized faces in all of America. And he said to his wife, you know, everybody in America knows me. Uh, we can go anywhere. We can have our privacy because people want to come and shake my hand. And so they would go on vacation, but people will recognize them. And so on this particular vacation, they decided to go to a little fishing village way up there in the state of Maine for the Canadian border. And he said to, they said to themselves, nobody will recognize us here. They don't play football in Maine. And so he went there, and then in the afternoon, they wanted to go to see a movie. So they went to the, the Madden show. They call it the Madden? Okay, all right. The New Day show. And they walked into the little theater, and as they walked in, all the people struck the scarab morning. And then Don Shula turned to his wife and said, you know, even here they recognize me. So we can't go anywhere without people recognizing us. And so he turned to the people there and said, one of the ladies said, what gave it, what gave it away? How did you recognize us? Uh, and the lady said, we didn't recognize you. This is the only theater in town. And there were eight of us sitting here for the movie to start. And the movie, the theater manager has a policy that we need at least 10 people to begin the movie. And when the two of you came in, we got a quorum of 10, and so we stood up and applauded you. And then the lady turns and said, by the way, who are you? I'm glad to see that we got so many of you here today, starting this uh, Friday evening and beginning the Sabbath. But wherever God's people are, the Bible says wherever two or three are gathered in God's name, he is present there. And it has been my joy over the years to go and preach in churches where there may be just a few people. As I said, one church, they had just a few that I stood right in the middle there and preached a sermon there. But I have said to God, uh, promised God years ago that I would go anywhere he calls me and to share his word with them. And so I'd like to thank Eddie today so much for the privilege of coming here and sharing this message with you tonight. When I do prayer meetings at my church, I often make an outline. So that if I don't get through with it, you can take it home and do a little more study on that. And so I have an outline for you on the title that I'm going to be uh, talking to you about tonight. Bloom where you are planted. But before we look at that outline, I hope you have a little time because I was told to stop at 8.25. And uh, so we'll do the best we can. Before we get to that, let me share with you a story. I love telling stories because... You know, stories are the way of gripping people. Because after the, you forget all the theological terms and all the theology and all the technical jargon that theologians use when you go home, it's the story that you remember. And when you remember the story, you remember what the, the message that the preacher's trying to get to you. And this story was told years ago, written years ago by W.A. Spicer. And I found this story in a little book. And I did a little more research and I expanded on the story because Spicer doesn't give a whole lot of details. But I found a lot more detail to make it more interesting. And so I hope you, all of you, especially the young people here, will enjoy that story. And I've wrote, written it in a very descriptive way so that, I'm going to, so that it'll, be, it'll be interesting and you'll enjoy it. And so I'm going to stay very close to the way I've written it. But I want you to, to get uh, to know what the story is all about. To get the full impact of the story, you must be able to visualize. There are three towns mentioned in this story. Three towns. Only one is named. The other two are not named. But something is happening in each of these little towns. Try to put it together. All right? 
This is how the story goes. The city of Plymouth on the southwestern coast of England is famous in American history because it was from this little town that the pilgrims first set sail for the United States in the year 1620. But this picturesque waterfront town is also the scene of one of the most incredible stories of God's intervention in the lives of his children. This is how the story goes. While Captain Jarvis was fast asleep in his warm, comfortable bed in Town A, two men got into an argument in a crowded bar in a large country town many, many miles away. Captain Jarvis was in his bed in this little town. He was fast asleep, but in another town many, many miles away, two men got into a fight in a crowded bar. One man, after being beaten by the larger man, one was a big man, the other was a small man, and the big man beat the little man real bad. And the little man was so embarrassed, and you know, he felt so bad, he threatened that he would kill the big man, the bigger man. And the big, unruly bully looked at the little fellow and laughed, and then just walked away. A month later, Captain Jarvis was in the town of Plymouth. This is the only town that's mentioned by name. Here's Captain Jarvis's town. Here is the town where the bar was. And far away from there is the town of Plymouth. So a month after this fight took place in this town, Captain Jarvis left his little town and came to the town of Plymouth for an overnight business trip. He had a long, tense day, and so he just couldn't sleep. So he walked around town and looked at all the shop windows, the park, and the famous courthouse clock. Plymouth had a famous courthouse clock. He wanted to see that. And since the, clo the clock sounded off the hours with an unusual gong, every on the hour it sounded with a very peculiar gong, and he had heard so much about it, Captain Jabba said, I'm here anyway, so let me stay here and listen to that. Stay a few more minutes and hear the memorable sound. So he stood near the decorated base and noticed that there was another man standing there looking up at the clock. I've never heard this clock sound before, said Captain Jabba. I want to hear it once at least. And the other man says, you know, I too want to hear it. And as they were talking, suddenly... It was midnight, and the clock began to strike. One, two, three, four. Captain Jarvis had to move away from the base because it hurt his ears so much. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. But before he could move far enough, the clock struck one more time. The clock struck 13. The two men stared at each other as if to say, did you hear that? The clock actually struck 13 times. With that, the two men laughed. They discussed the usual, unusual incident and then went their separate ways. Several weeks passed and Captain Jarvis was back in his hometown, in his bed, but unable to sleep. All through the night, the scene of the clock striking that extra time passed through his mind. 